All right, I'll begin with a word of prayer. Ahem. Hem. Ahem. Hem. I repeat. Ahem. All right, there we go. It almost worked. Dearly Father, we uh, thank you for this day. Uh, again, I thank you for these students. Just ask you to bless our work today. Help us to glorify you what we do, Lord. In your name I pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. So, I had a quiz, and um, I was going to give to you at the very start of class, but um, I will delay a bit because there's some examples you should see first. So, don't worry. There'll still be a quiz today. So, example one. Suppose we've got dy dx is equal to, oh, I don't know, um, e to the e to the x, well, uh, e to the minus 2x um, over y, all right? And you're given that um, x naught, y naught is on the curve. Oh, on the solution, all right? So I haven't done enough of those like this. And there's one kind of, that's, there's, there's a problem on the quiz which has like, it's not just solve it, it's got like, you know, a, pr a point that you wanna make sure your solution goes through. So I wanna work at least one of those before you had the quiz, so here we go. Um, fruit fly. Now, um, so how do you solve this? So I heard separate, separate. integrate, and that gives us one half, y squared is minus one over two, e to the minus two x plus a constant. Why the minus one half over here? What's that? That's a u equals minus two, su two x substitution, right? It's a calc one integration. I mean, I hope you can do that one in your head. If you can't, write out the u substitution. I don't, I won't count it against you. Unless you do it wrong, but um, but you won't do that. Now I want to solve for y, right? So this gives me y squared is equal to um, you know two c uh, minus e to the minus two x, right? And then I can solve for y, right? What's y equal to? To see, there's a 50% chance you're right, right? Because it could be plus or minus that. Remember, the square root of a squared is not a; it is the absolute value of a, right? Which is plus or minus a, depending on the context. Okay, so then what? Well, I know that x not y not the solution, yeah. So I plug that in, that gives me um, y naught is equal to, uh, well it's actually, you know, it's actually more convenient to kind of go back to here to plug it in. That gives me y naught squared is 2c uh, minus e to the minus 2x naught, right? Which tells me that 2c is actually equal to y naught squared plus e to the minus 2x naught. So therefore I get y is equal to plus or minus the square root of, well, 2c, which was y naught squared minus e to the minus 2x naught um, but a bit, a bit, a bit, a bit, minus e to the minus 2x. And that's the best I could do for this problem. That's actually not the best I could do. I could do a little bit better, yeah. What, what happened to the 2 in front of the c? I solved for 2c. See what I mean? I'm sorry, that was horrible. I regret nothing. All right, so, you see? All right. Um, so, I can improve this answer slightly by telling you which is plus and which is minus, right? So like plus, if uh, y naught is greater than zero, and minus, if y naught is less than zero, right?
Now, of course, I can easily test if you understand this by instead of giving you an arbitrary point, making the point like what? So, for example, if I, if I say, oh, I don't know, um, 0, comma, um, minus 3 is on the solution, then what? We'd write y is equal to minus the square root of uh, 9 minus e to the, oh, well, what's e to the 0? 1. What's 9 minus 1? 8. Yeah, so 8 minus e to the minus 2x, right, for instance. And yeah. Um, is that a negative or a positive e to the negative 2x? Negative. You solve for 2c, so. But the minus is from here. And it's still there. It's still there. It's, oh, over here. Um, it was still here. But then I solved for 2c, which means I added that to the other side, so. Oh, this, oh, oh, I'm sorry. I'll, thank you, thank you, very good. Um, so apparently, it's not eight, it's what? 10. All right, I was about to, my next sentence before you guys jumped in and found it for me was gonna be, now we should check our solution, right? So what I was about to do was to plug in zero and see that I got the square root of eight minus one, which is the square root of seven with a minus outside. Like, ah, no, it didn't work, right? But you already fixed it for me, so you've, you've deprived me of the joy of showing you that my, this, this, was an on, this, this mistake was on purpose for your learning, but I see that it worked, so good. Um, no, so 10 minus 1, if we plug in 0, is it's 9. The square root of 9, also known as 3, minus 3, because there's a minus out here. Minus 3 is what we wanted. My point to you is that when we take a square root, we have to allow for plus or minus, and you may be forced to choose the plus or the minus depending on the initial condition. Yeah? Now, if I just ask you for an implicit solution, you can kind of dodge this, right? Like an implicit solution to this problem, which works for everything, um, you could have just like, well, anyway, um, you could have plugged, you could like, you could take this formula for 2C right here, yeah, and just plug it in here, and then that equation would be an implicit solution, which goes through x not y not whether y naught's positive or negative, it, it would be legit. Um, <clears throat> there's another uh, calculational technique which I haven't done with you guys yet. Um, for exact equations. And so let's, let's talk about that for a minute. Um, well, probably five minutes. So in Calculus 3, we talk about conservative vector fields, right? And one of the things, so a conservative vector field is f such that it's equal to the gradient of some potential function, which I'll call little f here, right? If that's true um, on u, which is some subset of Rn, then f is conservative, right? And we'll We'll come back to that another day and talk about how that has to do with conservation of energy. There's a problem at the end of your, your homework, which is about that, yeah? So that is, I mean, physics 231 is a prerequisite, and we do actually make use of that prerequisite in this regard. Mm. Okay, so, um, great. There's like a four equivalent statements to this, right? The one is that if you take the integral around any loop, it's zero which is just kind of like obvious once you know this, right? Because if you integrate around a loop is zero, if you have, you also know the theorem that like the integral of the gradient along a curve, right? So if the curve goes from point P to point Q, right? Then the fundamental theorem of calculus for line integrals says that this is F of Q minus F of P, right? So this is the uh, fundamental theorem of calculus for line integrals. So 
surely if you were to integrate around a loop, what do you do? You just, <laughs> you know, take this point to be P and, and Q, and so the integral around a loop of a gradient is zero. So that's one characterization of a conservative vector field. Yeah? And, um, of course, I've also talked to you guys about um, how, I think I've talked to you a little bit about how the integral, uh, how the, you know, the curl of the gradient has to be zero, right? I don't know if I, did I talk to you about that or not? I, I may not have talked to you about that. Why is the, the integral, um, well, th another way to look at this um, is, well, I don't want to talk about that at the moment anyway. So, but the other, I'm just, I'm going to just say that, you know, another idea is we can check that the curl of F, which is the curl of the gradient, right, then that's equal to zero. That's another characterization. If that's true on a simply connected domain, then we can prove that the vector field's conservative, all right? There's like four equivalent characterizations of a conservative vector field on a, um, simply connected domain. So this provided U has, is simply connected. All right, but that, the, the, the fourth characterization though um, is actually the one that grounds us here for the calculational technique, which is that um, we have path independence. Path independence. So if we if we were to calculate the integral um, along a curve of f dot dr, we have the integral along another curve of f dot dr, all right? Where c1 and c2 are coterminal paths. Coterminal. I can spell eventually here. Coterminal paths in u. So that's that's the. The fourth characterization of a conservative vector field is, is, it is one which is path independent. So this path independence allows us to build, to construct, to formulate little f from big F. All right, so like here's the deal. If this is my, my universe in which we know f is conservative, I can pick any point in here, right, like, like said, let's say r naught, all right? And to calculate the, you know, the potential at, 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 at R, what I do is I simply define F of R as equal to the integral from R naught to R of F dot dr. And that makes sense because it's path independent, right? So you can take any path you like from R naught to R. Now, the way you see this in electromagnetism, for instance, a little bit, or, or physics, is like this. Your force, well, excuse me, your potential energy um, at position R is equal to minus the integral from R naught to R of your force dot dr. The minus is here so that we end up getting that the force is equal to minus the gradient of the potential energy function. So, um, and like in electrostatics, potential is actually potential energy per unit charge. So you basically divide the blue equation I just wrote by Q and it gives you the electric potential is equal to minus the integral of the electric field dot dr from, from R naught to R. Now R naught is the place, what happens when you put R equals to R naught? The integral is just, if you integrate from a point to the same point, what's the integral? Zero, right. So this makes phi of R naught equal to zero. So phi naught, uh, so, so R naught is the origin of your potential energy. So it sets the zero. But this actually gives us a template for how to solve exact differential equations. See, because an exact differential equation is nothing more than the differential form which corresponds to a conservative vector field in the plane. So I can adopt this approach for a exact equation to find the solution. 
So like for my exact equation, I can think about r naught as just x naught y naught. And I can think about r as xy. All right. And I'm going to erase some of this stuff. <clears throat> and um, all right, so if we have, <clears throat> excuse me, if we have f equal to like m comma n, right, where um, m sub y is equal to m sub x on simply connected u, a subset of R2, then this integral of f dot dr, right, over a curve, which is a subset of u, is, pa is path independent. I mean, I usually refer to the force as being path independent. Well, let me just say, is independent of path. Uh, I, that's not the right way to say it. I'm sorry, let me stick with my previous language. Then f is path independent, right? And specifically, we can, we can define little f, um, little f of x comma y as equal to the integral, say from x naught to y naught to x comma y of f dot dr. But let me, what that is, is m dx plus n dy, right? And you're like, well, that doesn't really seem like much of a calculational technique, does it? I mean, what do I mean? How do you actually can calculate this integral? Would you like to me, I mean, I could be more specific. Like, we can make a choice, right? So that, what, what I've written right there indicates a, a, a more general calculational procedure, procedure, but if you want me to just kind of like make it more, have greater specificity, we could pick the, the line segment, we could do like this, right? We could go do 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 and do 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 like so, right? Something like this. So this would be, you know, um, <coughs> excuse me. So this point right here would be what? It would be um, uh, x comma y naught, right? And um, so here, dr would be like dx comma zero. And here, dr, we could think of as being zero comma dy. Um, so I can do, so the, the first one, so when I, <clears throat> it may be helpful for me to go back to, I'm gonna jump from here to here in my thinking, all right? So like f dot, f is mn, so f dot dr will give me integral of m dx. Now m of what? Here, we're looking at the points like, let's say x is equal to t, y is fixed to be y naught, all right? dt, and where, where does t range from? Starts at x naught, it ends where? At x. And then, so that gets me this part of the integral, and then this part, I start, so this one, I'm gonna, when I take this dr dot m, excuse me, dot f, I don't get, this piece goes away, and I just get that piece. So I get n, and what's the first, so it, you know, parameterize this line segment, what do you have? You have x equals to x, so you push x there, that's fixed, but, you know, arbitrary, and then um, point in the domain in question. And then the, the, the y va ranges from y naught up here to y. So I put a t here again, and my, my integration um, range goes from y naught up to y. And that is straight up a formula 
for the potential. Right? So this is another way we could calculate the potential for an exact equation. Let me try to like, let me try to put this into practice for the first example. I think the first example is actually exact as well. I believe you can prove any separable equation is exact. Modulo some like quibbling over like domain division by zero stuff. <clears throat> All right. Let's see if we can do this. So you guys help me out. What is the example one when we put it back into Fafian form? I'll start us out. We've got uh, minus e to the minus 2x dx, right? So I multiplied, I multiplied dx to the other side. Then I'm going to multiply y to the other side, which gives me y dy, but I want them all to be on one side. So I have e to the minus 2x dx minus y dy equals to 0. Now I've, I've put example 1 into so-called Fafian form. Now you can identify your m and your n, right? So here's my m, quote unquote, and here's my n, right? And notice that m sub y is equal to n sub x, right? The partial derivative of this with respect to y and the partial derivative of minus y with respect to x, they're both equal to big fat zero, which means that this differential form satisfies the closed condition. Where does it satisfy it? Well, it satisfies it on the whole complex, the whole plane. Sorry, I'm also teaching complex right now. It, it bleeds through sometimes. Um, so the whole plane, which is simply connected. So therefore, this is in fact um, the vector field, m comma n is conservative. And so this whole argument I went through goes through. So now all that's left is to pick an x naught y naught, right? So, um, but we'll, we'll, you know what, let's not do that. Let's leave it as x naught y naught. That's part of the, what I want to show you. So if we integrate from x naught to x, so I want m of t comma y naught. What's that look like here? See, this right here is m of x comma y. This is n of x comma y, okay? So what is m of t comma y naught? So the, the, the y naught does nothing, and we just have e to the, e to the minus 2t dt plus the integral from y naught to y, my n is what? Yeah, minus, it's my, exactly, minus t dt. All right, and this is, this is all my formula for f of x comma y. And so we do this integral, right? We get minus one half e to the minus two t, evaluate that thing from x naught to x, and then minus one half t squared, evaluate that thing from y naught to y. Lo and behold, we have f of x comma y is equal to minus one half e to the minus two x, I'll put parentheses out here, minus e to the minus two x naught minus one-half parentheses y squared minus y naught squared. And if you set that equal to a constant, well that, that's a solution, right? If we set that equal to zero, what's its meaning? In other words, that would be where is the potential equal to zero? The construction of this potential is made such that when we plug in x naught and y naught, we get zero. Right? Like when we put x naught, we put x equals to x naught, y equals to y naught, both of those integrals collapse to an integral over a single point. 
which is just zero. And it's also manifest from the formula, right? If you plug in x naught and y naught, this is zero. Yeah? But it's also true that the differential of f is what? m dx plus n dy, right? By construction. Which means that what I've boxed is a solution to the differential equation. But it's not just any solution, it's the solution which goes through the point x naught y naught. So if you don't like this thing where you're, you know, fitting in the values, you can also use this sneaky integral technique. I don't know if it really helps that much, but it's, if you're having trouble calculating the f for exact equations, I guess this is a method. Here, let me, let me show you how I usually do exact equations. Um, if we had, oh, I don't know, x um, minus uh, y e to the xy dx um, plus inverse sine of y minus um, x e to the xy dy equals to zero. It's fairly obvious this is not linear. It's fairly obvious this is not separable, which means for our current intents and purposes, it must be exact. Otherwise, it's an unfair question. I don't ask unfair questions, though, right? No? I don't know. <clears throat> I'm not sure if I know what fair means. Anyway, so, um, but this is closed. If you calculate the x, the y derivative of this, you get minus um, xy e to the xy. If you calculate the x derivative of all this, you get minus y, minus xy e to the xy. So these, this is closed, all right? So what I usually try to do is I usually just try to like integrate with respect to like partial x and this is, this is, don't tell the other math professors I wrote this, integrate with respect to partial y you know, like integrate x holding y fixed, integrate y holding x fixed. And so this suggests that f is one half x squared um, minus e to the xy, all right, plus some constant which is possibly depending on y. And this, oh, integral of inverse sine, I forgot that one, I better work that out. Integral of inverse sine, how do you integrate inverse functions? You're like, well, that's 1 over sine. If you say that's 1 over sine, ooh, that's bad, because it's not true. So this is an inverse function. So um, this would be my u. This would be my dv. Um, so that gives me y inverse sine of y minus the integral of v du. Well, y and then dy over the square root of 1 minus y squared, see, because the derivative of inverse sine is 1 over the square root of 1 minus y squared. That's derivative of inverse sine. And then that's a w substitution. So I got myself so a y inverse sine of y minus 1 half, you know, the integral of dw over the square root of w, which, let me stick a fork in this thing, I think it's done, minus the square root of y plus a constant. There you go. There's your integral of inverse sine. So this suggests that f is equal to y inverse sine of y minus the square root of y. And this piece here, when I integrate with respect to y, again, is going to just give me this e to the xy term plus c2, which is a function of x. Now I look at these two, two different terms, right? And I just pick one of each thing I see. One of these guys, one of these guys, one of these guys, one of these guys. I already got it. So altogether, my potential for this, one half x squared um, minus e to the xy plus y inverse sine of y minus the square root of y all right, that, that's a potential. I could add a constant to it, right? And so if I set that equal to a constant, this 
is the implicit solution to star. So more often, I don't see like I don't use that formula on the middle board much, but I, I do think it's worth talking about because it again makes the connection with calculus three perhaps a little bit more apparent to you. Now you may be in the boat, you're like, but I've forgotten calculus three, so you're wasting my time. If so, I'm sorry, but what's done is done. Any questions about this? Yes, no, maybe so. Yes, sir. Which is the one and which is the other? Example one versus the middle board. Oh, I almost, I don't force you to do this. I don't expect you to know it. But there are times when it's convenient. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, that's one of the nice things about differential equations is I don't usually have to force a technique. <laughs> like, usually the problem demands it. <laughs> uh, and if there's more than one way to do it, I'm usually very happy if students do it either way. So, as long as they do it correctly. All right, so the next thing on my docket is like to show you guys applied examples. You know, things like, suppose we have um, a velocity-dependent friction force. How would we si find the velocity? How would we find the velocity as a function of time? So let's, let's look at one of those. Do, 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 do. <coughs> Make sure my phone's not playing tricks on me here. So example four. Suppose that we have the net force is equal to minus beta v, All right, where beta is a positive constant. So this would be a velocity dependent friction force. All right? So we're talking about it, you know, so if it's the net force, we know that it's the mass times the acceleration is minus beta v, right? So, lo and behold, we have m dv dt equals to minus beta v. Can we solve this? Yeah, like this is taking, I mean, this is easy, right? So we got what? We got dv over v is um, minus beta divided by m dt. Now here's a trick. It, when we're solving physical problems, we want to usually write the formula in terms of initial conditions. An easy way to weave initial conditions into your solution is to do integration of matching bounds. So every time we do separation of variables, we're really applying the, the U substitution theorem from calculus. And the U substitution theorem from calculus essentially says that you're changing your integral from one coordinate to another. And when you do that, something you may remember is we have to change bounds. What that looks like here is something like this, initial velocity to the final velocity. And likewise, we integrate from the initial time to the final time. So matching bounds. And that will automatically weave the initial conditions into your solution. Like here we go, natural log, absolute value of V, uh, Vf minus the natural log, the absolute value of V naught, equals to minus beta over M Tf minus T naught, like so. Then at this point, I'm just like, okay, so let let the final velocity be v, and let the final time be t, just so I don't have to keep writing f. Then, with that little change of notation made at this juncture, I couldn't make it before, see, because the reason for that is that I would be conflating the um, arbitrary but fixed uh, time and velocity we're trying to find the formula for with the variable of integration, which um, is just bad form. So I use this VF as kind of a, you know, intermediary. So we've got natural log of the absolute value of V minus the natural log of the absolute value of V naught 
minus beta over m. We're assuming the mass is non-zero, right? So, sorry light. So that properties of natural log is the natural log of the quotient of V by V naught. And then exponentiate this thing, what you got? You got the absolute value of the quotient of V by V naught is equal to the exponential of minus beta over m t minus t naught. And then finally, we get V is equal to V naught e to the minus beta over m t minus t naught. And so there you go. This is the velocity as function of time t. If the friction force happens to be linear with the velocity, right? I could easily calculate the solution for a friction force which depended on the square of the velocity or the cube of the velocity or something else like that, right? You just do what? You just replace like this with like v squared, v cubed, whatever, yeah? Now there's another problem that we often ask in here. <coughs> which is, can you find the velocity as a function of position? Can you find V as a function of position? All right. But that we'll have to wait for next week. So, shush. I'll let you guys get started. Do, 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 do. Make sure I don't turn on, make sure I don't hand you the solution, that would be bad. Right? <laughs> take one.